Hello everyone, this is Tom in Los Angeles. I hope you're doing well. Uh, we are here ready to go with uh, canto number five of uh, Purgatorio. I'm uh, recording on uh, Sunday, June the 5th today, 2021. It's a beautiful sunny day and uh, there's probably gonna be a little bit of wind. Hopefully you can hear me okay. The fifth canto of Purgatorio is uh, actually a, a really uh, descriptive canto and so I don't think I, I have a lot to say in terms of what else I can bring uh, to the comprehension of the canto, at least to understand what uh, Dante is telling us, if not a little, a couple of details about the historic characters that he mentions. Um, it's uh, very much, we're still within uh, uh, the anti purgatorio and we're going to meet with some more late repentant souls. Uh, very interesting because in this canto we get three brief um, autobiographies of uh, two of them are of two men and one of a woman and this woman is going to be the first woman to actually talk to us since um, an entire cantica ago which was francesca in canto 5 of inferno so we've gone for 33 cantos without any woman speaking and now a woman is going to be speaking directly in uh, to us at the very at the beautiful conclusion of this canto right after dante leaves belacqua and his group of souls immediately after he's walking away with virgil and he hears the souls from behind call after him because they have realized that he's projecting a shadow and uh, the way they call after him might seem or might uh, look like they are really curious about it or maybe that this type of reaction is a unhealthy uh, distraction or uh, curiosity on their part but really it's not and we, we're gonna understand why the souls say to dante um, the sun seems not to shine on his left side this is because dante is facing west and the sun is striking him from the north in this particular scene this is why, and Dante keeps uh, giving us details about his astronomy, which, as I already said, I'm fascinated by, but not too interested. It's not the most interesting part of, of, of this portion for me. Dante turns around and notices that it's the souls talking to him. So he slows down, slows his pace. He doesn't stop, but slows his pace. And at this point, Virgil um, starts uh, almost uh, a long scolding towards uh, Dante, which is really long and uh, some have said it sounds like an exaggerated scolding, maybe because of uh, what has ha happened just before with Virgil and his mistakes. But uh, even in this case, we can see that uh, Virgil is making yet another mistake in um, confounding the soul's uh, excl exclamations for purely a distraction, when really the souls have a uh, an edifying and positive reason to be interested in Dante, which has to do with their uh, fate and uh, the fact that Dante being alive, they can have some uh, benefit by prayers from people in the real world or by Dante himself. In any case, the way that Virgil addresses Dante here is uh, extremely beautiful as always. And in fact, the, the line in Italian, sta come torre ferma che non crolla, Jamai la cima per soffiar di venti it has become very, very famous in Italy. I think it's carved in uh, a few Italian, it's been carved in some, in some Italian monuments as well. Virgil says, why should you care about what's whispered here? That makes us wonder because the words were shouted, not whispered. So why is it saying whispered? It's possible, which is exactly what he's saying in Italian, pisbiglia. It's, uh, strange but it could mean that uh, Virgil is uh, giving the words of these uh, souls a particular meaning of uh, uh, waste of time and so almost like gossiping or uh, a wasteful type of talking or is it or it might mean that Virgil is saying is referring to actual whispering that took place in the scene right after the initial shout and it's so true it's so true that uh, the man in whom thought tr thrusts ahead of thought allows the goal he set to move far off. Who in our world today is not, has not experienced that? One thought 
chasing the other and uh, having a little bit of difficulty in uh, focusing and concentrating on one thought or one task. So Dante has nothing better to do or nothing else to do than follow Virgil at this point and he's blushing. He has a feeling of uh, shame which can be positive in this sense. Dante is almost as if he realizes that he's been thinking about himself or of himself a little too much. Meanwhile, a little bit ahead of them, of Virgil and Dante, this new group of souls uh, appear and uh, it's really beautiful because we remember that in um, Purgatorio there is so much music, there is a lot of singing and there are a lot of smiles. In this case there is beautiful singing. Uh, the souls are singing the Miserere, which uh, um, I understand that uh, Dante presents as averso averso, miserere verse by verse, in the sense that in those times somebody was singing a verse and the choir was, rep was responding, and back and forth and back and forth, in this sense verso averso. Miserere is uh, maybe the most uh, famous or one of the most famous uh, psalms. It's Psalm uh, uh, 50 or 51, depending on the uh, Bible version that, that you're reading. And uh, it's possibly the only psalm where uh, faith is uh, expressed as a very intimate and uh, personal experience. Uh, it's uh, possible to say that uh, Canto V is partially modeled upon uh, this psalm at the Miserere. We remember that uh, Miserere was the very first word that Dante uttered in Inferno I when he saw the shade of Virgil, have mercy on me. And uh, it reminds us that the base of all virtues is humility. And is thanks to humility and the way that humility uh, found its way into Dante's heart that he is able to proceed in his, in his journey. Let's also remember that uh, Dante always intended the Divine Comedy as a spiritual guide. So he's, he's never um, really looked at it purely as a literary tour de force or simply a masterwork. He knew he was writing a masterwork, but uh, this aspect of uh, the Divine Comedy as a spiritual guide, as a how to live your spiritual life, uh, is sometimes neglected in our secular universities and secular world. On uh, verse 52, the souls are uh, explaining to Dante who they are and what they're doing there. They are repentant souls, just like anybody else in Purgatorio. And they say, we all were done to death by violence. They were all uh, dead by violence. And we all sinned until our final hour. Then light from heaven granted understanding, so that repenting and forgiving, we came forth from life at peace with God. Um, it's interesting here because it means that they have a double need for grace to repent, first of all, even if it was the very last minute of their life or second of their life, and to forgive. Uh, both things are necessary for them to be here in Purgatory, so they, they also have to forgive the person who uh, killed them or made this type of violence uh, uh, to them. It's very interesting how Dante doesn't recognize anybody in this group of souls, and in general, in, in Purgatorio, he tends to not recognize anybody, or less than Inferno for sure, where he knew <laughs> almost everybody who, who ended up in Inferno. It's uh, for, probably for the reason that uh, uh, he wants to show how um, he's growing. He's growing spiritually himself as well. And so by presenting us with people that he actually didn't know, and uh, acting kindly to them, he's actually showing us his uh, generosity, his understanding, uh, and the fact that he is uh, really growing in, uh, in, in terms of uh, charity and his altruism itself, which uh, was not as uh, visible in the first cantos of Inferno. So there are two very clear keys that lock this Canto V to the Canto V in Inferno. One is the fact that Pia, at the end of the canto talks and so just like Francesca is another woman speaking and we'll have many more women speaking in Purgatorio and Paradiso by the way. The second one is on verse uh, 59 and 60 where Dante talks about the spirits born of goodness. This is a precise reference to the spirit born of evil 
that uh, Dante referred in Inferno 5 verse 7 when uh, he was describing Minos and how Inferno worked. So the first of these three autobiographies uh, begins at uh, line 64. The first one is uh, um, Jacopo del Cassero. Jacopo del Cassero was a warrior and a politician. He was a Guelph. Um, Dante doesn't need to mention his name because the story was so famous, everybody knew it at his time, in his times, both of him and of his uh, enemy or arch enemy and opponent who got him killed. His name was Azzo d'Este. Azzo d'Este was actually still alive in uh, uh, 1308 when uh, the Divine Comedy was first published. Therefore, Dante couldn't really play um, another literary trick to put him in his poem. He couldn't mention Azzo in, in Inferno. In short, Jacopo was uh, uh, Podesta of Bologna. Podesta was the highest magistrate of, uh, of the city for a while. And already then, he had opposed uh, this Azzo d'Este with uh, a lot of injuries and personal attacks, etc. They were real enemies. And in the certain moment when uh, Jacopo was uh, nominated or elected to be Podesta for Milano, Milan, he decided to take a long way around because he knew his life was at risk by doing that trip from Bologna to Milan. And in the space or the territory between Padua and Venice, he was attacked by the agents or assassins sent by Azzo and killed. His home was in Fano, which today is in the region of Marche, very, very beautiful and quaint little town in the eastern, in the eastern coast of Italy. And um, Dante mentions Antenor's sons simply because uh, he probably wants to um, hint at the fact that uh, somebody from Padua el helped Azzo to kill Jacopo in this rivalry because Antenor was the famous Greek who betrayed Troy and the name of Antenor is where Dante uh, took his inspiration to call uh, one of the rings of the ninth circle Antenora from Antenor. And Jacopo's story ends uh, in a very dramatic way with uh, a pool of blood uh, coming out of his veins uh, um, where he fell in the um, region of uh, Oriaco, which is between Venice and Padua. The second autobiography is by Buonconte da Montefeltro. Buonconte da Montefeltro was a Ghibelline leader uh, known uh, probably much more closely by Dante because he was the Ghibelline leader who participated to the Battle of Campaldino. He actually headed the Ghibelline forces in the Battle of Campaldino of 12 89, and we know that Dante himself participated to the battle on the side of the Guelphs. He was on his horse, probably full of fear, but uh, he participated to the battle. That's why on verse uh, 91, Dante can say, what violence or chance so dragged you from the field of Campaldino that we know nothing of your burial place? It was kind of a mystery for everybody who survived the battle. Where is uh, Buonconte's uh, body? Nobody could find his corpse. They knew he, would, he was dead, but uh, his corpse was uh, not to be found anywhere. So Dante imagines the fate of uh, his body and his soul in a very dramatic and fictional way. So Buonconte was pierced, was wounded in his throat, and uh, he ran away from the battlefield. He ended up close to uh, a river. And uh, just before dying, he uttered the name of Mary. So he repented by praying to Mary. We know that what happened to Guido was that his soul at his death was contented between an angel and a demon. And in the end, the demon won and dragged him down to, to hell. The opposite, the mirror image, happened to Buonconte, who was his son. Uh, Buonconte, in this kind of imaginary a fictional tale that, that Dante is telling here. Buonconte had a genuine um, penitence just before dying. And uh, this is why uh, it's almost funny the way that uh, the demon says, look, it's just a well, little tear, which is in Italian, una lagrimetta, very, very little tear. It's not enough, you know, the demon says, it's not enough for me, I'm gonna drag it down. But the point of the scene being that it doesn't matter how small the, the tear is, uh, for God's mercy. Uh, Dante says, as long as the repentance was genuine, the angel has the right to take 
Bon Conte's soul and bring it to Purgatorio. Dante concludes his uh, fictional recounting of uh, this tale by telling us uh, about Bon Conte's body, the fact that it was uh, then taken by the forces of the river, the waters, and then buried underneath the detritus, etc. Uh, it's possible, that's one possible version or theory that was going around about, but nobody found the corpse of, of Buon Conte. Interesting how Buon Conte laments the fact that nobody is actually praying for him in, in the world of the, of the living. So Dante uh, is really going a little bit beyond what we've seen Dante do so far, and he is uh, in an altruistic um, gesture. He offers to pray for Buon Conte uh, himself. That's something that, uh, especially for uh, Ghibellin, uh, makes us stop for a second and uh, wonder about uh, the positive effects of uh, this journey on Dante himself, the character. And we finally get to the final, third and final uh, little autobiography, which, even if it's the shortest one, is in, by no means the least important. Uh, in fact, I believe personally that it was written by Dante in this way, at the conclusion of the canto and in this uh, intense and powerful way to highlight that it was a very important one. Uh, as we said, not only is the first uh, woman who talks since uh, Canto V was Francesca, but uh, it's also uh, an episode full of mystery in the simplicity with which it's uh, narrated. Because uh, Pia is somebody from Siena who we, to, even today, don't know exactly uh, who she was. We have a little bit of uh, some tales from uh, the contemporary commentators, but not much more. And she says, pray, after you return into the world, when, after your long journey, you've rested. Important couple of uh, opening lines, because uh, she, it's almost as if she's putting Dante's uh, care and interest before her own. And it's uh, typical of souls in Purgatorio, but we're not used to this. If we have, if we're coming from Inferno, and we've, uh, we are used to how the souls in Inferno talk. So a way for Dante here to highlight that uh, care for the others, care for the good of, of the others, is something that is not uh, possible to separate from spiritual happiness, from the real happiness. May you remember me, who am La Pia. Siena made Maremma and made me. There was a story, who knows if it's a legend or if it's, or if it's the truth, that her husband, Pia's husband, had a servant throw her out of the window of a, of a house or a castle. And so she uh, hit the she died when she hit the ground. This is why she said Maremma and made me, because Maremma is the hard land that destroyed her flesh. The Italian version of this uh, unmade is this fecemi, which has a sense of uh, destroying the body as well in the world itself. And uh, so it, it would make sense if that was in fact uh, how things went, the way um, this tale narrates it. But Pia from Siena was not a famous person. Uh, maybe the story itself was known, um, but it wasn't very, she wasn't very famous. And uh, she concludes by saying, he who, when we were wed, gave me his pledge, and then as nuptial ring his gem, knows that, it's a little sinister how she's pointing at her husband, maybe with uh, care because all these souls have already forgiven their killers or their attackers. Uh, and so she's a little careful in saying that. But uh, we, from the reader's point of view, feel this chill down our spine when she says he knows that because she is pretty clearly uh, pointing, pointing her finger. And I personally think the conclusion of this canto has a particular beauty uh, as uh, very uh, often with Dante from a visual point of view because he ends uh, with this image of uh, the gem disposando ma viva con la sua gemma the fact that gemma is the very last word of the canto uh, means something lyrically it's a perfect beautiful conclusion of of this canto which i love it's a, it's a really, really beautiful canto. It makes us uh, think about uh, miserere, uh, humility. It makes us better understand the dynamics of this antepurgatorio and of purgatorio. And uh, it introduces us to some uh, 
uh, late repentance who despite being late still had time to receive the mercy of God so thank you so much for watching this video and uh, we'll speak soon for uh, Canto 6